Well, since we since our moderator, the person who was supposed to moderate, had an injury and could not show up, um, and I am a blabby person. <laughs> um, you're going to blab. I'll start the ball rolling. But I, I want to say, you know, I kind of feel like the lightweight on this panel. Uh, and I, you know, I, I feel the difference in my own contemporaries who are steeped in that, in that traditional music. I did not grow up with anyone in my life who could teach me this stuff. But I heard it. But I would, was like a sponge in West Virginia, and I would... Um, I would learn anything, like, you know, I'd be in the church folk group, you know, doing the kumbaya stuff, and the, and the other guy who, in the group had the local garage band, so he'd teach me, like, Suzy Q on the, you know, the rock and roll songs on the, in, the, in the breaks and stuff, and a friend of mine's dad had a bluegrass band, and I'd go sit with him, and he would, he would teach me tunes, and, but it was like Swiss cheese. So I, I just didn't have anyone to help me. I, when I was, like, on fire... I had to piece together this kind of uh, um, whatever I could learn from whoever would teach me. So for me, I, I built this career and then I had to go back. Um, I, I got this opportunity to go back and make this record about coal mining. And so I got, to, I got to really dig down in. And it felt very much like an archaeological dig. It felt like just turning over rocks and surfing up the word coal and every song it would bring up and talking to people and getting records and looking online and ordering old records. And, and then I got terrified that I was going to sound like a lounge singer because I've not grown up singing this stuff. And so I wanted to pay homage to it, but I didn't want to... Um, uh, I didn't want to, I mean, really, you try to sink into a Hazel Dickens song and you are humbled immediately if you didn't grow up in, you know, in the, on top of a mountain somewhere. And um, I, I just sounded just completely, you know, inauthentic over and over and over again. I had to, like, try to understand the way Hazel approached it and then try to get into the lyric and how I would sing the lyric. And I could do that and it sounded ridiculous. And then I would go sing it like Hazel and I would just sound like a bad imitation. And I just kept going back and forth and back and forth until about six or eight months after I started trying to learn this one song, it kind of all came together. And it was like me doing it my way, but with a nod to it. Um, and I'm not stupid enough to think that there aren't people who think, who rolled their eyes when they heard that the first time, and maybe still do. But I found my way into something that felt uh, honest enough uh, and like I had put enough work into it that I could expose it and be okay with it. But the one thing I want to say about it as the, as the lightweight on the panel is that what happened for me when I made this record and I went back and found all these tr great traditional songs was that it changed the way I, it changed everything about music for me. And it was kind of an interesting point of view to do it backwards because all of a sudden songs I'd been singing for years made sense to me in a different way simplicity about lyric writing made sense to me in a different way. It wasn't about the bells and whistles. It was about a deep kind of honesty and a deep kind of expression. And so all of a sudden, I let go a little bit of the grip I had on the bells and whistles around it all. And I, I tried to strip away maybe some of the stuff that had built up on me over the years that I thought I needed to do to deliver a song. And so suddenly, I, I had a different approach for songs that I've been singing for a long time and stories that I've been telling through songs for a long time. And that, for me, was the value of traditional music. Um, I'm still kind of lazy about it. You know, I'll pick up things and work with them for a while and I'll do one song at a time as opposed to like, you know, I could play really bad frailing banjo. Uh, but I, I've got a couple songs that I feel okay I can do in public. and. <laughs> Uh, I'm just kind of slowly working my way through all that stuff, but it's been life-changing for me and a deep appreciation of something that's that's really uh, about the essence of what I've been doing, something really essential, the, the, the deepest seed of what I've been doing for many years. So that's, that's what I'll throw out as the opening gambit, and I'm hoping that that maybe gave you guys a jumping-off point to speak from your own point of view about well, you know what I was just going to say in reaction to what you said? How many Bruce Springsteen fans do we have here? <laughs> okay. So, you know, if you followed Bruce's career, when he started out, he was really writing kind of lyrical poetry. Um, 
you know, a la, um, you know, like Bukowski and those kind of guys. And, and his early music was very, you know, symphonic. There were all these little symphonies and uh, go very different places in his music. And then he starts really listening to Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie. And all of a sudden, Nebraska, you know, the music changes and it becomes much simpler and it becomes much more focused on just the storytelling, but, you know, very more simple kind of words and ideas. And, um, and he also got from this traditional music, this kind of paring down. Now he's kind of come back a little bit and he discovered, you know, the power of church <coughs> and anthemic music, but he, you could see in his music the journey that he made once he got mm -hmm. into this traditional music, and then he made the, the Seeger Sessions record, which was, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm choking here. <coughs> Me too. <coughs> well, it's dry in here? Tickle. <coughs> the ultimate, uh, you know, the ultimate <coughs> journey to the folk music. So, uh, <coughs> you're not the only one who's taken that path. <laughs> I feel like that's <coughs> sort of my path. I mean, I am maybe the ultimate outsider on this panel. We could have a, you know, argument about that. But uh, I grew up in Miami-Dade and Miami <coughs> County down in Florida, the, the only place in the country where we have to go north to get to the south, as uh, we sometimes say. But, um, no, I totally was it. Traditional music was not on my radar the world before I was born was almost not on my radar uh, <laughs> up until a certain point. Uh, it was about 15 years ago. I was, um, thank you. I was, I grew up on, you know, Beatles, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, stuff that's, you know, on the verge of whatever, folk, pop, rock kind of thing. And uh, my journey kind of led me backwards from popular music. It was really the first step was a Birds album. I was a huge Birds fan and one day I started getting into Sweetheart of the Rodeo uh, which was their album with Graham Parsons and a lot of head nods and on that album happens to be a Woody Guthrie song uh, that they did and uh, Merle Haggard and I was also one of those I don't like country music people, sorry. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, that's changed. Anyway, so I started, oh, there was a Leuven Brothers song on there. So anyway, I start reading at the time, you know, this was the late 90s, all of a sudden the Leuven Brothers reissue is coming out, and I read about it in the paper, oh, that's interesting. So I get it, I'm like, wow, this is really cool, and I'm kind of, and then realize reading more about them and tracing it backwards, which eventually led me to the Carter family. I came to a, a CD, and on the back of the CD it says, you know, the big bang of country music, the Bristol sessions where they first recorded, which they were, you know, some people call it the big bang of country music. So I was like, okay, I found, you know, this was a fascinating journey for me just to go back and learn about country music and, and roots music back to the beginning of it all. So, uh, so I was led to believe the Carter family. But simultaneously to that, uh, there was a reissue of a record set that came out in 1952 mm -hmm which I have in my car. I meant to bring it as a visual aid. I'm sorry, I can show it to you later. <laughs> the Anthology of American Folk Music, which came out in 1952, Harry Smith, uh, Folkways Records, six record set that uh, covered old ballads. Like, I'm getting ahead of myself because I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was cool. In the review, it said, that Bob Dylan had given it to Ani DeFranco on a tour as a gift. I was like, whoa, that sounds important. So I got that, and I listened to it, didn't fully absorb it, but I was playing it in my car. I was like, this is cool. It was just like these old field, you know, well, record company recordings from the late 20s and early 30s. And I understood that that was a world before, that that was music from the 1800s, maybe the 1700s, and, and even earlier with the ballads. But I wasn't, and I just thought it was cool. It was like an interesting curiosity, cool sounding. And for me, the Big Bang moment was when I realized that the Carter family is on that CD, is on the anthology. And that's what you know, made the continuum wide open from contemporary music, not beginning with the Carter family, but the Carter family representing music that went back 100, 200 years before it, 
that was, you know, my moment where it was, I was a singer-songwriter before that. From then on, you know, I came and I, you know, became a student of history. All of a sudden I was understanding that these were songs that came from the British Isles and uh, styles that came from France and Africa and the music and the songs and the rhythms and the way they came together here. And it just, you know, made such an, an impact and a connection that since then that's all I've been doing is studying and learning songs and playing them and listening and uh, it just totally opened up all of history for me, traditional music did. That's the end of my story. <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do now? So what I do now is I basically do a lot of traditional music. From it was it was weird. I I was doing shows with a band of my own songs and uh, started reading the Lomax books, cowboy songs, and other frontier ballads like the first collection, one of the first collections of American made folk songs, and. Uh, you gotta I, talk to Kerry Grombacker. Do you right. know him? No. He's here. Okay. And I learned uh, a couple cowboy songs, and so we're on stage with the band playing, and I'd, I'd be like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a song now, and then I ride an old pain, I lead an old dan, and they're kind of like, what's he doing? <laughs> a month later, like, we had like two shows like that. The band broke up literally within a month. I was on stage at two in the morning. I did a whole cowboy song show, telling the stories of the cattle drives along the way, doing you know trail songs and and uh, night duty, you know cattle lullaby kind of things. So now what I do is I I read about uh, this stuff. I I mean I I got a banjo in very short order. Started coming up to Mars Hill and to. Uh, Davis and Elkins College and, and learning as much as I could from, from actual people also, which is a great thing to be able to do. And I play all kinds of traditional music from Appalachian ballads and fiddle tunes, cowboy songs, sea shanties, whatever, and I tie them all together in, in shows. So you do and mostly like trad-oriented music in your shows? I would say pretty now? much, yeah. For a, a, a few shows I mixed the traditional with with my songs and once I came out with my first CD of all traditional songs uh, I just have been all traditional yeah. Wow. traditional up until I mean even going I go ahead into a little bit of jazz and Dixieland and Western Swing and stuff that you know 20th century but for me it's just the whole continuum of and where are you music. based out of now? I'm based in the hotbed of traditional uh, music in Hollywood, Florida. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So, so it's history, right it's American history, mu musical history, Yes. music, and I mean, it sounds like it's, um, it's like you're really a historian at heart. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it went hand in hand. I mean, people always comment because I'll tell the stories of the songs at the shows and, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been as interested in the music if I just heard it without knowing where it came from and who made it and why. And I wouldn't have been as interested in history if I wasn't also able to hear their songs and sing their songs. It's one thing to read about it in a history book, but when you're singing a song that came from a coal mine or that a pioneer sang on their way out west, you know, all of a sudden you are, you know, feeling what you're singing the, the same thing they saw, you were, I, I mean, can't connect much more than that. But, uh. <laughs> I gotta call you back. <laughs> but I turned it off. Sorry, really sorry. Okay. It hasn't rung in like three days. It's just funny that it's technology invading in a traditional I know, music and I'm, I'm, sitting on, I'm sitting on yes. the traditional music panel and my ringtone is uh, Disco Inferno. So. <laughs> um... Or sh sh shall I speak now? Vinny, you want to go? Should we go girl, boy, girl, boy? Uh, whatever you want. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's so interesting. I, I can't believe I haven't met it's you yet. It's so interesting in for the me, world, too. I mean, in the world of music. And I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. That's the thing. There's so much. Thank Andy for that, though, because Andy's behind the scheme to mm. collect a lot of people who are uh, dedicated to the traditional music who don't know each other. Because that was that's my my big uh, 
disconnect is where the hell are you? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know you're out there. I say, there's YouTube, who's that? You know, and, and, and but to actually be able to commiserate with people who have the same sort of, you know, obsession is really fantastic because it's hard to find any kind of commercial niche that it really encompasses that, um, the way it's being done at its best, I think. And there's a, a lot of people now who are doing, picking periods of history, like the Civil War, and really, yeah. and really educating themselves on the human stories, the, the relationships, uh, family relationships, brothers on different sides of a battle, uh, the great, tra great tragedies, and, and all the, just the music of that period, the instrumentation and the music, and the great the stories, and they're, it's becoming a um, sort of a, a, a whole niche in, it, in, it, in itself. But it's hard to find like, oh yeah, well, because I used to go to these blues societies ar around the country, and it's so commercialized, and people don't know anything about the music. I mean, you have people saying, well, blues is, after all, just whatever you think it is. I so, said, yeah, okay. It's, that's like, I'm sure if you could say that about any musical form, people would kill you, you know, anything else. <laughs> and they just really, it's very commercial-oriented. People don't know differently. It's soul and blues rock, let alone, like, acoustic, traditional guitar. They do, it's like... You know, they they actually like it when they hear it, but if you told them you played that, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. I get this all over, you know, this traditional music thing. Oh, is it, they'll think maybe something from Nashville, mm -hmm. um, you know, some real famous personality. Say, is it like that? Or <laughs> Because it has, it is sort of, you know, in terms of the, the the front hasn't been sort of coordinated front, like-minded people. So, but you, that's what Andy has done here for this conference. He's put a number of these things together. So, so how were you born into the blues, or how did you? Uh, well, I thought from? she was going to talk. Oh, all right. God has done <laughs> much greater service than I. Have. Well, I will talk. I've got a few angles I find very impelling. So I'll just get it off my chest for whatever it's worth. And I'm going to start on a very personal note because I got involved with this music very young because of a very unique sort of uh, early life uh, family that came out of uh, a very serious uh, turn of the century, Little Italy, Little Sicily, organized crime, black hand violence environment. Uh, people who had no trust of government at all, who d didn't, it, the communities where police never went because they were killed immediately, that took care of all their own grievances with each other, and uh, um, a whole attitude of being actually a little split personality where there were times where there were entertainment opportunities, you know, and there was a lot of music around, festivals and things like that. But for the most part, it was an environment that was very bleak, dark, and it, it, it was the op opportunity to really express yourself emotionally was extremely uh, <laughs> restricted. And on the other hand, you have the black sheep in the family. I had a, an uncle who was a, a very po successful, popular singer in Chicago. And my relatives lived down next to Maxwell Street. And all these family people grew up down there. And we all, they used to take me down there when I was a little kid. And I would hear this blues, and this gospel music on the street. And to me, it was enormously magical because of the license to feel. And there was something happening there. It was not happening in, uh, with Frank Sinatra and uh, all this. And over the years, I've come to identify that with, obviously, today music is, <clears throat> I want to make some money and get some, sell some CDs and, and have audiences play for you. But this music, traditional music, comes from when people had to have it to live. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it to make money. They didn't do it. 
Well, there were, you always have people who say, yeah, just, just get a guitar and get the girls and get some easy money. That's true, that does happen. But the music itself traditionally comes out of basic human need to survive at a time before there were shrinks, before there was trauma counseling, marriage counseling, before there, there, there were doctors, where doctors were d totally distrusted, uh, before you know you died at home, had your children at home, you died at home, and uh, uh, you lived, you got through life, hard, harsh life, maybe terrible dangers in your own community, or just you know starving to death, or what you know, all these harsh conditions of life. Uh, they had families, communities, and. The music came out of this. How do you deal with losing this kind of loss? Now, you know, how do you deal with you having four children, five children, and losing your wife? How do you deal with the children dying? How do you deal with all the the things that 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 happen? And so the music was just a, a incredibly interesting. And of course, yes, in churches, very important but in the home and in the community. And especially in the black communities where a lot of different styles of blues come from and they're sort of like you know, a dark side and a lark so light side of blues. There's this, this whole delta, uh, what they call backdoor music, stuff which was considered the devil's music and even B.B. King's parents like wouldn't let them play it in the house. There was a time when there, a lot of black communities the people would not allow a guitar or a deck of cards in the home because it was all associated with juke joints, and that's where everything bad happened. Mm -hmm. So people gambled, lost things, got shot, and everything bad happened down there. But then there is this other thing that you find in a Piedmont and a lot of other areas that are a little more remote and rural, where it is a family tradition and a community tradition, and everybody worked hard outside on a farm, they played every day on the porch, Crop season, they all got together and played, and occasionally a traveling musician would. But this was a, really the way they lived. And it's hard to imagine now, or average home in America, people spend all these hours they spend watching TV. To a great extent, many of those hours were spent involved in music, in a total amateur environment, but with brilliant people. I mean, because people who play that to get through life, well, that stuff's going to work. I mean, that's how it evolved. And what is amazing to me, and even technically on the guitar, the kind of, uh, and instrumentally, you see the kind of creative things being done with instruments that people grab, and they start with one string tied to a barn door and, and you know, a cigar box and... And, and make their own instruments. And, and you see that this becomes uh, uh, such an intrinsic part of it. And I always say it's a, it's a people's music for all occasions. You know, there's, there's funny songs, there's songs about domestic problems, domestic quarrels, songs about heartache, death, uh, loss of hope, salvation. I mean, everything that they're trying to tell you how to get, get there on TV every day. You know, this was what people look to, to a great deal, is this music, especially in their community, their church, whatever tradition they had. Now, when I grew up in Chicago, this was an incredibly ethnically diverse place. So I have always been, had a natural um, connection to all traditional ethnic cultural uh, types of music it, because it all is so special. I love Middle Eastern music. Um, I mean, I, being Italian, I played the accordion. I was doing, you know, played more polkas and operas than anything, you know. But people loved it. You know, you played it because people like, they, you know, people will pack a church, you know, to hear some, a kid play accordion, opera on an accordion in these communities. They didn't have money to go to a club or, or, or do any of these things. And 
barely, when I was very young, people didn't even have record players. You know, most people had radios, but the records is where you really get to choose, you know, the, the music that you want. So for me, there was always a very rooted thing about it. And I think that, uh, and also, since I didn't have the benefit of any real formal musical training on the guitar, and I don't do any bar chords, and I've actually had done a lot of hard work in my life, had some injuries that sort of limit what would be normal dexterity. Uh, I, I I love being able to see what somebody like Lightning Hopkins can do without ever playing a bar chord. Mm. I mean, when you see what they're doing, the way these forms evolved, uh, these individual chord shapes, and the and 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 how they find the pentatonic stale, you know, through time. And you also realize that by the time Lightning Hopkins comes around, there's a hundred years and thousands and thousands of individual modifications made on that song. Hmm. All geared towards getting it to work for a bunch of people. One thing John Lee Hooker said at, towards the end of his life, what he really missed, he said he missed the people. Because I saw John Lee Hooker when he was still doing, when the blues phase was dead and everything was going to Motown, you know, and these guys couldn't hardly make a living for a while. And in a little club in Detroit, him and Muddy Waters, like, played five or six sets or something, <laughs> like. And this club had, the room wasn't any bigger than this. And Muddy Waters had his whole band. So I, that segues into the next thing I discovered about traditional people who play because these people played all the time. So many of these people, Lightning Hopkins hit the road when he was eight years old. And he used to steal his brother's guitar and was so good at sneaking around playing, his brothers gave it to him. He used to beat him up first for taking his guitar and then <laughs> he gave it to him. And that there are so many of these people that were really like savants musically. Don't know where they got these ideas exactly, you know, but they they play this stuff and it works. It, and if you can capture it, even if you don't want to play like somebody, so many of these techniques, even the simplest licks, some of these licks, I don't care where you go, you can have a, a, a noisy audience and you can take some of these simple licks that are so cool and if you can get the right inflection on them, I mean, people will quiet down. There, there's something about these these intervals that they found. And this is across all these traditional forms. It's not just it's not just blues. When you hear these people, you hear the Carters, you hear these these things, you know you're really listening to something that is like getting in the inside of some family, multi-generational family. I mean, this is a whole culture, a whole history is behind this, this music, the way it's played, all the different people that contributed to it. So I think it's, first of all, very rich in terms of material ideas. If you're a songwriter, I think that looking and seeing the kinds of themes, kinds of songs that endure is a very important exercise. You hear some song that was written, you know, 100 years ago and kicks ass today, uh, despite becoming from a totally different world, no relevance, you know, people would be totally aghast to sit in a room right now. They wouldn't know what was going on in the world. Then just musically, that's something we need to get a handle on. I don't think we can afford to just not look at it. Because these things work. It's not just dead history. It's not just, like if I were studying armaments, obviously it would be sort of silly to, obviously an old bow and arrow is not as good as a new one. But in music, that's it's not true. I mean, they could have found something musically, quarterly, on an interval, on some inflection, something that is really magical, that is always going to be magical. If now and forever, and it's just laying there. Yeah, so the you can listen to a lot of it, and maybe not 
get excited about all of it. But I think there's, you look at all the uh, Scotch, Irish, you know, the, all the ballads. There's such, it's such a rich uh, uh, amount of inspiration thematically, songwriting wise, and instrumental te technique wise, I think. Because they did some really creative things that people may not just come across, you know, in their normal musical education. And, uh, yeah. Oh, well, when you're done. Yeah, um, yeah I'm done. I'm pretty <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, like some of you here, I, I sort of came to the traditional music late, kind of discovered it later on. My dad was in the Air Force, so I spent most of my childhood abroad, and we had no radio or TV. We just had records, and he liked the Kinks and Trio, so I learned all these Kinks and Trio songs. And uh, then when I came to school here in North Carolina, they had a folk festival one time, and I heard real traditional musicians, and I went, oh, <laughs> this is different from mm -hmm. Kings yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is really something else. But I, I just wanted to, to share with you all one anecdote. When I first moved to Asheville over 30 years ago, um, Don Petty, who some of you may know is a great mountain dulcimer player, he, uh, he offered to take me out to a, to a real jam session, traditional musicians. And I said, yeah, sounds great. So he took me, uh, we drove north out of town into a little community called Lester, north of, uh, of Asheville, to uh, the home of Chubb Parham. Chubb Parham. And every Saturday night for 20 years, he and his buddies would get together and play music, right? Fiddle, banjo, guitar, and all this. So I come into this, and, and uh, I mean, it was a real real cultural experience. I mean, first of all, all the players were men, and they were all in the front room, and all the women would gather in another room where there was a table laid out with uh, white bread and Cheetos and, and, and you know, craft cheese slices and, you know, bologna and, you know, just, and great big real jugs party. of Mountain Dew yeah. and Pepsi. I mean, okay. So we go in there, and I'm playing music along with these guys. And there was, you know, there was what you'd expect to, in the way of fiddle, old fiddle tunes and such like that. But and, and everybody in that room would be, by anybody's definition, a traditional musician. They just played for fun, just for their own enjoyment. For 20 years, they'd been doing it, and over half of their material was popular songs from the 20s and 30s that they'd heard on the radio. Now, is that traditional music? Of course it is. It yeah. is for them. Mm -hmm. you know? But um, the point of this story is that real traditional mission, musicians, the ones that, that I've met, who, who don't play for money, but just play for their own enjoyment, they are a lot less purist in their definition of what traditional music is than a lot of us who came to it later and now see ourselves as kind of the flame keepers, you know, carrying the torch of traditional music along. Well, I, I'd like to comment on that. That, that, that yeah. is something we forget. That e I don't care even if all these people, as soon as there were records, they listened to them, they loved music. Not only that, a lot of those people, the, the blues guys, were trying to make a living, and they wanted... They try to place things they thought people would like, right. and they so. But and even before there was a radio or records, people listened to different kinds of music, and we all know that many of the lyrics and many of these songs evolve sort of uh, bilaterally through from the British Isles through Appalachia and into the Delta, and they they morph into different. Different things because they listen always listen to each other's music. It's amazing. Even BB King cited Hawaiian music as an inspiration. They all loved these Hawaiian guitar players because of the gorgeous tone they got, you know. And 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 it had a big influence on uh, on on a lot of blues players. But Mans Lipscomb. The other thing is a lot of these black players who played sometimes for white people. Some, they really it did have a, a wide ranging repertoire. They would assume that other people would uh, want to hear different music. And so they knew a lot, they could play a lot of stuff. But somehow when Mans Lipskin plays, uh, 
sort of away uh, 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 folks on it, it still sounds like Manslipscum. <laughs> you know, there's something that is retained in the style and flavor. Yeah. But and there is... A, sorry. No, but there is a, a, certainly this, this cultural mix. There's no question that popular music of all kinds in this country is, was, was affected, songwriting especially, by blues, then jazz, and the Harlem Renaissance and Broadway really at night, they were like this. It was like a, a just an open open border there, you know, with the, with the ideas going back and forth. What happened, I think, with a lot of the old blues guys that did have wider repertoires is the record companies that were recording them at the time were trying to market them and record them in their race record series and wanted them, they only wanted to hear the blues. So if, you know, an old, you know, one of the blues guys started playing a, a more contemporary pop song or a sentimental ballad or something, they'd be like, oh, let's just get the blues and release that. So, you know, that's one way that it's easy to, to lose yeah, sight Yeah, that's an that. important point, that what we hear on records is really what a white businessman decided to put there. Mm -hmm. That's, sure. that, that is the one wrinkle in all of this <laughs> is that somewhere along the line somebody made a calculated decision that this would sell and that those songs wouldn't. Do you want to speak? Your well, Andy's got his hand oh. raised, so. Uh, empirically, they were right. The blues, the 25,000 blues and gospel records that we have um, a uh, a discography for, we call it GDNR, uh, DGNR, Get the Dicks and God Rich and Rye, it goes from 1890 to 1943 and includes everybody, every black person that made any kind of not jazz, not popular music, but specifically blues or gospel. It includes a certain amount of black old time music, fiddle players, the Mobile Strugglers, uh, or a fiddle band, uh, Howard Armstrong and Ted Bogan recorded fiddle and band, fiddle and guitar things. And uh, it turned the whole music business on its head, the, these 25,000 recordings upended taste, the American taste, um, sometime after 19, the Depression of 1907, uh, jazz marched into northern climes. <laughs> it didn't come up the river on the boat. They hired them in New York City to entertain the white folks. Uh, Kenny Goldstein, the folklorist, you studied with him, didn't you? You didn't. He said that the folk, the people, the working class, the people we consider, are the most eclectic in their taste, which you would figure because they're statistically <coughs> the largest group. Um, but that whole collective super organic repertoire contains an awful lot of traditional music. And you can get really technical about what constitutes a traditional song. I was reading somewhere the other day, the point of pointing out tradition is to continue the passion, not to worship the ashes. That's Who said that? And we worship cool. the passion. Yeah. You know, I saw Reverend Gary Davis turn 500 Jewish kids wearing yarmulkes just like mine into holy rollers in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was uh, quite an experience for a 17 year old, I gotta tell you. All right, well, I'll share my story, which is somewhat different. I got into folk music much earlier, and uh, I'm just curious, how many people here are actual musicians who are here as musicians? 
Okay. As opposed to people Presenter. who are either presenters or something else. <laughs> okay. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, I grew up outside New York City on, in the suburbs, and I grew up in an upper middle class Jewish household in a neighborhood that was probably 90% Jewish. And so, um, exposed to many different cultures, I wasn't. <laughs> um, but I, first of all, I don't think you can overstate enough the importance of the folk revival in the early 1960s. And if you were alive for any part of that and you were into music at all, it had a profound influence on everybody. And, and people are still kind of waiting for the next folk revival. But um, I was lucky to sort of be on the very tail end of that. And uh, you, the popular music included, mm -hmm. you know, Burl Ives and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and they were, they were playing traditional folk songs. Um, so uh, where I grew up on Long Island, um, my mother got a guitar for my siblings and I, and we started lessons when I was 11. And the very first song I learned on my very first lesson was Blowing in the Wind. So Dylan was into that, you know, protest music, uh, just starting to go electric phase. And uh, I just took to it right away. I had studied piano, um, picked up the guitar, I immediately started writing songs. And uh, so it was a good time to be a guitar player. Everybody was playing guitar. Um, so uh, after a couple of years of taking lessons with this guy, and the books that he taught me from were um, books of really traditional folk songs. And so I was learning how to play. I mean, after the Bob Dylan song, you know, then we opened up, you know, the Happy Traum book of, of uh, acoustic blues and... Um, there was a Mel Bay book of classic American folk songs, and so I was starting to learn these folk songs. And after a few years, I was really into it, and uh, my mother could see that I, I needed and wanted more. And luckily for me, there happened to be this very seminal guitar school on Long Island that was called the Guitar Workshop. And it was uh, the brainchild of this man named Kent Sidon, who had been a classical guitar fanatic and also a folk music uh, fan. And he started this guitar school that it, it, they weren't just teaching guitar, but they were teaching folklore and folk music. And, uh, and there were some very important people in the folk world living on Long Island at that time, mm -hmm. very close. One was Gene Ritchie. You all know who Gene Ritchie is? Yeah. Okay. Um, and her sons were at this music school with me, and the other one was Frank Warner. Um, so, does anybody know who Frank Warner is? Um, he was a very, very well-known folk collector, uh, music collector. I think his collection is probably maybe the largest after, like, the Ch Child and uh, Lomax, and he collected a lot of he, he was the first one to record Tom Dula, which mm -hmm. became Tom Dooley, which became, you know, that huge hit for the Kingston Trio. His son was, was teaching there. So for some reason, you know, this, this kind of upper middle class <laughs> enclave of Long Island had a lot of these, you know, folk music intelligentsia there. <laughs> and so I started going to this school, and there I am going with Gene Ritchie's kids and Frank Warner's son, and so like every Tuesday night we had to sing. And we just got together and sang, and it was led by Frank's son, Jeff, and another couple of guys. And we sang everything. We sang everything from, like, Bob Dylan songs to sea shanties to um, uh, traditional folk songs, you know, like the Banks of the Ohio. And, and the point of it was just to sing. So I was getting exposed to stuff that way while I'm learning how to play guitar. And uh, it was a school that I went to sort of after my regular, you know, everyday school. So like, my mother had to drive me there. It was probably 10 miles away. And after a few years of that, 
I'm so now I'm like 16, 17, and I'm super interested in boys. And I'm walking down the halls of this school, and I see this guy, and he is so handsome. I can't take my eyes off of him. I've never seen him before, and I asked my girlfriend, "Who's that guy?" And she said, "Oh, he's the new banjo teacher." <laughs> so. Went home, said, Mom, I gotta start taking banjo lessons too. <laughs> She's like, What? I said, It's really important for my musical development that I immediately. So I, I, I went to a flea market. I, I literally bought a, I think it was a K banjo for $5. And I begged my parents to let me take banjo lessons. So that's how I started playing the banjo. I got the banjo, I got the teacher got the guy, lost the guy, kept the banjo, and the rest is history. <laughs> but between, uh, between the guitar and the banjo, I was, you know, really getting immersed now in traditional folk music. And, you know, back in those days, um, this guy was very smart, and he figured out to, how to offer a curriculum so that teachers... I don't know how it is down here, but in New York City, in, in New York State, teachers once they get a teaching degree, they they have to keep taking courses every couple of years and amass a certain number of credits, and then they work towards a master's, and it's kind kind of like a racket. So um, he set up this like summer curriculum, so that so that elementary school teachers and high school teachers could study guitar for the summer as part of their credits. So he got these people to come and teach courses, and he got this uh, one guy um, who was actually a historian. And the guy came in and did this series, and it was all about certain events in history, that in American history, and the accompanying folk songs that had been written about them. So I remember taking this course, and it was, it was like never had American history been so interesting. So like, for example, he would talk about the Civil War, and then, you know, you'd learn the battle cry of freedom, um, and he'd talk about, you know, this strike and that strike, or this, this you know, episode in history. And so you, you really got a sense of tying these traditional folk songs, or songs that, you know, were probably composed at the time they were written, but now have entered the tradition, and tying it to American history. So for me, that was really fascinating. So, you know, now it's time to graduate um, high school. I'm still in love with my banjo teacher <laughs> and, and deciding where to go to school. And uh, there's a state university uh, out on Long Island called Stony Brook, and uh, they had a very good music program, and my parents... Um, desperately wanted me to go to a state school so they wouldn't have to pay private tuition because I had a twin brother who was already going to a private college. They were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? So they really steered me towards this uh, state university. And since I was still in love with the guy, I had all these visions of I'd be able to go to college. And they offered me a job now teaching at this place. So I ended up going to this state university. And when I get there, within the first semester, I find out that this woman named Hetty West is there. Does anybody know who Hetty West is? Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't, she was one of these folk singers in the 1960s. Um, you know, she wasn't as famous as Judy Collins and, and those people, but she was very well known. And she's probably most famous for having composed, um, more importantly, copywritten the song 500 Miles which was a song that was a fragment in her family. And uh, she was actually there because her husband was teaching, teaching there. And so the university enlisted her to teach some courses on folk music. So as soon as I saw that, I signed up for every course. And uh, she, was, she was just fantastic. Um, she's, you know, a very educated woman. Her father, Don West, was a poet and he taught at um, one of the state universities in Georgia, and I think he originated the Pipe Stem Festival. Have you ever heard of the Pipe Stem Festival? Yeah, so he was very well known. But she came up north to like study classical 
flute, you know. She was not into her tradition at all. And then she comes up to New York, and this is again in the late 50s, early 60s, and she sees all these like white Jewish and, and Presbyterian guys, you know, <laughs> playing music that they went down to Appalachia to learn how to play. And she's like, oh, wait a minute, this is like, my family does all this stuff. And suddenly she saw the value of playing what she just considered, you know, the parlor music, just right. sitting around and playing. And she started doing it to make a few bucks. And, you know, one thing led to another. And she became, you know, a, a kind of a star in the folk world. So, um, so now she was also pursuing a, a graduate degree at Stony Brook. So she taught these two courses on folk music, which I completely gobbled up. And when it was done, I, I just couldn't bear the thought of not being, you know, taking another course. So I asked her if I could help her out with anything, if I could do anything for her. And so she said, well, let me think about that. And she approached the university and she got a work study grant for me to work for her as her assistant. So for the next two years or so, I would go to her house every week and ostensibly I was helping her index and catalog her record and tape collection. See, back then we didn't have CDs, we didn't have computers, we had a typewriter, that was it. And all, everything she had was on index cards. So I got to go to her house, listen to all this amazing music, listen to her tell me about it, and then tell me where it would file. A lot of the stuff that she talked about in her classes were the, the structure and themes of traditional ballads and music and so one of the reasons why it's worth studying traditional music especially if you're a songwriter is because you study the structures of the songs you study the structures of the ballads not just the musical structures but the the lyrical structures you learn about how there are certain floating verses and, and floating images that resonate throughout, you know, over a hundred years of music. And you also um, begin to realize the structure of how ballads were written, which are opposed to lyric songs, which are more florid in personal opinion, and the ballads are more kind of stark and just relate a story as if it was being like reported back in the days when they, they didn't have any newspapers. Um, and how people would disseminate information. So I found this kind of stuff invaluable and in my own you know, work as a songwriter because I was also doing my own music. So um, I, I worked with her for a couple of years. Plus also she was an amazing banjo player. She had an extremely unusual finger picking style. It wasn't bluegrass and it wasn't two finger picking. It was this very, very intricate, almost classical guitar-like approach to banjo. So, of course, you know, every moment I could, I was like, Hetty, can you show me how to do that? And can you teach me your arrangement of this and that? So she taught me a few things. And uh, then when I graduated college, I started performing. And um, I would do a combination of, like, you know, Robin music and, and popular music, like, you know, James Taylor or Simon and Garfunkel. And also this traditional music. So, I don't know, I'm talking too much here, but I'll just end up very quickly. So what I found was that traditional music was really, folk music was waning on college campuses. The, the kind of the folk trend was over. It was singer-songwriters now. And uh, so what I did was I still loved to play this traditional music, but it was, it was really hard to get booked doing traditional folk music. And one of the things I had done with Hetty was this paper on how, Im how women were viewed through traditional folk and blues songs, both here and in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. And so I fashioned this concert lecture called Images of Women in Folk Music, and I started touring with that on the college circuit. And it appealed to a somewhat different audience. It was a little more academic. It was great for Women's History Month. And I ended up doing a series of CDs on that. So it was a way to keep traditional music alive by putting it in a more academic presentation and context. And now it's finally starting to come back a little bit. You know, Chris Thiele and 
and all those all these new people playing traditional folk stuff um, and uh, what's her name Gillian Welch you know writing contemporary songs um, but writing them in the style of old ballads so it's, it's starting to come back again but um, for me the value of traditional folk music is the kind of framework it gives me as a writer to work in my own genre and um, to I, it also helps me understand where you know, like Dylan. Dylan ripped off so much traditional music and then copyrighted it as his own. And, you know, how he's been influenced by it and Bruce Springsteen and a lot of these people. So it's, I, I think if you're just a musician and you're into acoustic music, whatever that encompasses for you, whether it's, you know, country or blues or storytelling in your songs, this traditional music, you know, really learning about it is kind of invaluable. So... That's my story. Yeah, the master songwriters like that, right, like Dylan, I mean, they were, I mean, before he was writing songs, he was learning the songs. Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, they were all learning traditional songs. Little by little, they'd, you know, maybe rewrite the words or rewrite some tune. Or like Gillian, you mentioned, brilliant at just pulling the phrases out in the imagery and turning them into new songs. So yeah, that's your master class in songwriting is this whole body. As a listener, not a performer, um, something that I think has been mentioned is that the traditional music has proven itself over decades or centuries. Well, that's true. So you've got something there that will resonate with people whether they know it or not. That's why a lot of people who are into blues, then they hear Middle Eastern music. As you were saying, it's like, wow, there's similarities, differences, but you can relate to it. And so many different kinds of traditional music can be a bed to build your own stuff on because it's proven. Yeah. And you know, the other thing I wanted to say about that, not only Dylan and uh, uh, you know Springsteen, but the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and um, Led Zeppelin. They were all huge devotees of classic American blues records. And when they started playing, that's really what they wanted to sound like. They wanted to sound like all those old blues guys. Yeah. And, you know, then they morphed it into their own thing. But that's, that who is, was their inspiration. I mean, McCartney was also really inspired by music hall stuff, and he talks about that a lot. But but you know Ronnie Wood and John Lennon and George Harrison and um, Jimmy Page. They they worshipped the blues guys. Worshipped them. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the Beatles came over here their first tour. They spent most of their time uh, listening to American radio, listening to R and B, listening to all the 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 black uh, singing groups. You know all the girls, those great girl groups that were at the beginning of the 60s that were uh, coming out. And they just did nothing but suck up American music. And that's what Skiffle, the Skiffle, I had always heard about Skiffle because right. as a huge Beatles fan, I was like, what? And that's what the Beatles were, a Skiffle band before they were the Beatles. And right. that was the music craze in, in England in the late 50s, early 60s, around then. And I was, I was like, what is this Skiffle? And then I pick up some Skiffle collections, and it's American folk music played with drums and banjo. In Britain, they're playing Lead Belly songs and right. railroad yeah. songs and everything. And that that was the way these guys grew up, and uh, you know the Beatles and the Stones and all that. John's been awfully quiet back there, <laughs> and he's taking it all in. And I know from experience that there is nobody wiser than John Willie. Mm -hmm. So uh -oh. it's a lot to live up to there, John. I would like to pose the question. <laughs> what constitutes for you, what constitutes a tradition? I'm not going to go there. You're not, that's you're not that's gonna... impossible to define. Okay. It's a continuum. Uh, that goes back, like Matthew was saying, you can go back to the 1700s or even earlier. Um, and what's innovation today might be tradition in another generation. Um, like has been mentioned, you know, Dylan, Hank Williams, Bill Monroe, they were singer-songwriters. They were steeped in a tradition, but then they innovated within that tradition. 
And that's what fascinates me is where innovation and preservation come together. Mm -hmm. um, that's what what I basically have taken a long way around. I can come to with my own music. I played for years old time string band music. I was in a number of string bands playing just strictly old time fiddling banjo music. I was in a, a clogging group called the Greengrass Cloggers, and we danced and played and, and I absorbed that music from the ground up mm -hmm. and uh, learned a lot of songs, learned a lot of songs. At the same time, I was writing songs, but the two weren't connected until, I can't say exactly when, but at some point about 20 years ago, the innovation and the preservation came together within my own music. I began to write songs that reflected my deep interest and experience with traditional country and folk music. Like Kathy mentioned, you know, you get into Hazel Dickens and you hear something in there that you just might not have experienced somewhere else. I had the pleasure of knowing Hazel and hearing that live on a number of occasions, but there's a depth of feeling to her singing and her writing that you just have to be around it for a while and let it sink in. And same thing with uh, fiddle and banjo music. You can go to a fiddler's convention and hear a weekend worth of it, but if you spend 10 or 20 years playing that music, it really gets into your bones. And the uh, same thing with the lyrical stuff you were talking about, um, the way the songs are structured. There are a number of ports of entry into the traditions, but they all lead you. Someone pointed out to me, once, it's like this. You start out here, but you want to get here. You can take several paths to get there. But what you want to do is get to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I admire songwriters like, like Tim O'Brien. He's got traditional music coming from several directions, and he's able to incorporate it into his own unique and creative but legitimate style of music. He's written some great songs and he's a great performer. I think Gillian Welch is the same way. I don't know that much about her history. I'm, whether, where, she's, she's straight ahead LA, Hollywood. <laughs> she went to Berkeley, <laughs> College of Music. I mean, she's, somehow yeah. she managed She's like to, a, a construct in a certain way. Well, she found, she found her way to the music somehow. I think yeah. she writes some beautiful songs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul Williams, you know, Paul Williams um, from down around Kingsport, Tennessee. There are a number of writers who are able to take the tradition and create within it. Um, also instrumental music. There are people who write fiddle tunes who, and instrumental music that is based on tradition. So, Liz Carroll and the Irish. Right, mm -hmm. Liz Carroll for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where I would say the value of learning traditional music is it gets you closer to here. So, it has to do with continuity and innovation. Yes. I, I want to say something that I don't know if anybody else here would have, but you really sparked this for me. One of the experiences I had when I started digging into this music is that, um, you know, I, I, I've not been kind of one to poke the dragon you know I've, I've not wanted to go like stir the pot but I have found that so many of these old songs articulate the experience of people right now who don't have a voice and that by singing the old songs in certain contexts mm -hmm. that experience said more than any words I could ever say that was another piece to me that was so has been so like some of the some of the Gene Ritchie songs, you know, Black Waters and mm -hmm. and the mountaintop removal that's going on in Appalachia right now, and and singing that at rallies and stuff, and just you know, watching how that song that was written so long ago, or Red Wing Blackbird, or some of the other things, um, they give it, it, they stand the test of time, and they give voice to something that's very deep that is still going on, and you um, know, in, in a very unique way. Um, and very uh, concise, you know, very economical. It's not an hour-long speech. It's a three-minute song, and it touches people in a different way. I just wanted to, I think that's been part of what I've, was an unexpected part of the experience for me. You know, you were saying before about, like, learning the tradition and feeling like you couldn't really, uh, like, articulate it well, you know. I, I don't think you necessarily have to imitate it to be able to 
you know, perform it or have to imitate it in order to find your own voice to sing it. Um, a lot of people do that, I know, and um, but you know, I think what you're talking about the the innovation, you know, that's where that's where our own personalities come through. I mean, it was very jarring to hear. You know, the Kingston Trio saying, you know, hang down your head, tum do, you know, about a guy who's, you know, going to the gallows, you know. It was a little strange. Um, I don't think that was a great use of, you know, putting your own, like, pop spin into it. But, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a point between, you know, what you're saying and what you're saying where, you know, we don't have, we don't have to sing in a high lonesome style. Um, I mean, look at... Uh, you know, you know Nirvana, of course. You know, um, they covered "Black Girl" by Lead Belly, and um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you hear their version of "Black Girl," you know, do you know that song? "Black Girl, Black Girl, Tell Me Where You Been All Night in the Pines, in the Pines, in the Pines." You know, now the, when they sing it, it's like it's startling, but it it works because it's kind of. It's like authentically them, you know, with um, Kurt Cobain. It's really his vision. But, and you can see that it's coming from somewhere, but, you know, if he sang that, you know, at a traditional folk gathering, he'd probably be booed or something. It's so. interesting, though. Seattle like, like, is a hotbed of neo-traditionalism. <laughs> and that's where he's from. All yeah, those punk yeah. guys well, who just grew like up, their parents were all folkies. But there's, there's something unique about that song, because I do that song. That's a great the song. Lead Belly version is very dark like that. Mm -hmm. He did a dead cover of Lead Belly's version. Very dark. <coughs> but that song is also covered by Dolly Parton, but it's a different song. That's one of those songs that is very old, back into the British Isles, that wasn't about a black girl, but is about a social situation that is uh, people don't understand now because this whole the whole railroad world is gone. But it's a situation where these railroad gangs were all over the country in remote areas and many of these workers had their families with them but that woman's home was dependent on her husband pulling that job and her husband gets killed in an accident and now she's mm. being made an offer for a chance to stay mm -hmm. from the captain and this is the kind of coercive situation that is a very old coal mining all, goes back all the way through our history. But when the song got to America, it evolved in a sort of a white Appalachian style, which winds up with Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. which is a much softer yeah. thing. And then there's this real dark version done by that's evolved in the black community because this is a very common thing that happened to them. The masters wanting have, you know, elevating women who didn't have husbands or whatever, just mm -hmm. sexual exploitation. And it was a very, very common theme. So, mm -hmm. so you do have two really completely different songs. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd make a quick comment if I could about this. I love this. The adapting idea. There's a very great uh, story about uh, Chuck Berry, who was a very practical character and who, who was a businessman and was uh, actually an interior decorator for commercial interior director. He liked to mm -hmm. make money. And he didn't quit that job until he actually could make more money playing the guitar. And he kept a journal. And, you know, and I started getting this much money and nope, not quitting my day job. Mm -hmm. But he made a specific decision, and this is interesting, he knew the blues. He could play the blues, you know, all the music, all the licks, Muddy Waters, all this stuff. And he said, you want to know something? All those guys are great, but they're only selling records to black people. And I want to be much bigger than that. And he said, so what's the key? He said, I want to appeal to everybody. I'm going to write songs about three things that universally everybody has the same relationship to. And that is romance, cars, and school. And you listen. <laughs> I'm serious. And this guy, he gigged in a that. huge Cadillac. That was his that was his motorhome. He lived in a huge Cadillac all over the country. He was driving. 
and he would go in, and he didn't care what the backup band was like. Yeah. He got his money up front, he went exactly. out and played, and he got back in his Cadillac. And uh, he deliberately did that. If you listen to his songs, Maybelline, I mean, everything is about school, and these huge songs fly off the chart all of a sudden. And the other interesting thing he did, he took blues and he changed it a little bit. And that is the old story, and even Muddy Waters would, t would tell the story. He changed the time signature from 12-8 to 8-8. Ah. And that is rock and roll. And that is exactly what defines rock and roll or, or, or blues rock. And that was Chuck Berry got the credit, actually, for sort of putting that scheme together. Because otherwise, it's very close mm -hmm. to blues, but you listen to it, it's really not. And of course, he was... He was a huge, such a big star that he was getting booked for huge concerts, like in, in stadiums in Texas, where they thought he was a white country singer and, like, wouldn't let him in when he got there. <laughs> he said, no, 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 you're not that guy. Because <laughs> the song didn't sound necessarily like uh, it came from... Maxwell I guess he didn't send him a headshot. <laughs> and of course, Andy and I are going to be doing a workshop tomorrow on open tunings and sort of using blues as a basis to discuss the, the open tunings. Keith Richards really reinvented uh, rhythm guitar by using open G tuning on the Rolling Stones. I mean, most of it are really, yeah, but tons. Yeah. He has a five string, you know, to basically a five string tuning you know, uh, Telecaster that he takes with him, plays all those songs, and they're the most definitive licks. And he did it because he said, oh, that's how they got those sounds, because I can't get standard tune, I can't mm -hmm. get these, fly through these these sounds like this. And most people don't know that at all. I mean, his is really heart and soul of rock and roll, and it's right, he takes a tuning from Muddy Waters. You know. Does any... I was going to say, maybe we should have some comments, but... Yeah. I would just like to mention, before people leave, there's some um, brochures and a flyer back here from the Library of Congress Folk Life Center oh, right. about um, doing research at the, the Library of Congress. And um, Jennifer Cuddy sent me that. Oh, okay. So if you need any help while you're at the Folk Life Center, Listening to some of these recordings that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. researching the lyrics of the songs, uh, just keep her in mind. And please pick them up before you do. Alan Lomax, who was probably the most preeminent American collector, um, there's been the, this project to digitize mm -hmm. his entire collection. And I believe that is available free online. Online, you can yeah, surf it up. Uh, but Cultural it's, equity, uh, I think. Uh, is apparently, the... it's hard to navigate. Mm. I've read, you know, posts by people who's like, I can't find this song, and other people say it's kind of difficult to navigate. Do you know anything about that, Andy? Andy. Andy. I think, I think it's the culture. <laughs> I think the website is Cultural Equity is the organization. And uh, I looked at it uh, like a year or two ago, just, you know, out of interest, and a lot, one of the problems is what things were named because they would be called Back something then. by the people that Lomax mm -hmm. recorded, but we might know it is something else, and I'm looking for, you know, I, I know that Lomax recorded an early version of something, but it's not, wasn't listed under that, and right. I ended up giving up after a while. I know that they were planning to improve the indexing. I don't know where they got, how far they've gotten with it. So here's just a cool little story about just one of those songs. Alan Lomax collected this song from a woman working across <clears throat> from a levee camp, I think in Georgia, like in the 20s. And her name was Dink. And she sang this beautiful, mournful song. And it went, uh, If I had wings like Nora's dove, I'd fly across the river to the man I love. Fare thee well, oh my honey, fare thee well. And it goes on for a few verses. And so the story is that they, when they come back from all their collecting and they're playing all their tapes, they really love this song. So when they go back the next year, they go back to the same place, the same prison, the levee camp, and they ask for Dink. 
and the people in the camp say, well, Dink's living up there now, and they point to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So she had died in the intervening time when they were first there. So, so this song is pretty well known. It's called Dink's Song. And um, does it sound familiar to anybody? Because you've probably heard it in um, uh, the Coen Brothers film, um, Lewin, Inside Lewin Davis. It starts the movie. It's sung by Oscar Isaac. And lo and behold, the copyright belongs to Bob Dylan, <laughs> who took, yeah. who, who put it to music and said, I'll be right, and, you know, basically borrowed the song big time. Hetty West did this, too, with Cotton Mill Girls. You know that song, Cotton Mill mm -hmm. Girls? Um, you know, totally borrowed stuff from, from the tradition. But anyway, those are the kinds of gems that are in the, uh, the Lomax collection. There's just tons of stuff like that. And what I was going to say to you is that you talked about the birds. So Roger McGuinn is a big student of folk music, yeah. and he has this thing called the vault. The folk den. The folk den. I thought it was called the vault. Maybe it was, I don't know. Where he <laughs> has been busy recording all these traditional ballads and my understanding is that they're for free you can just listen to them i don't know if you can once download a month them. he puts up a new one he puts and up he, a yeah, new song all traditional songs and puts them up on his website so um there's a lot of great stuff out there if you want to listen roger, roger McGuinn. McGuinn, who was the leader of the birds um, he's famous for the Rickenbacker 12-string guitar sound on songs like uh, Turn, 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 Mr. Tambourine Man. Yeah, yeah. He actually, this is fascinating about him. He was, uh, his name, his real name was Jim McGuinn. And when, you know, in, show, in folk showbiz, they told him he should change his name. Um, but he was a session uh, guitar player. And for a very brief period, I think he was part of the Wrecking Crew. Um, but he was probably the only one of the birds who actually played the guitar on any of their recordings. Everything else was played by the Wrecking Crew. And if you don't know who the Wrecking Crew is, <laughs> rent that movie on Netflix. It's absolutely incredible. It's all the big session players. Yeah, in all the big session players who, who basically played on... Most of the music you listen to every day. The defining licks on recorded songs totally. that we think came from the, the bands but were totally. really the session players. Yeah. So anyway, that's who Roger McGuinn is. He had his very distinctive voice and a very distinctive guitar style with the electric 12 string. And, uh, and he was a folkie <laughs> in Greenwich Village. Hmm. Um, I just want to say there's one thing that's kind of been floating around in my head since you spoke it. Um, I so appreciate hearing people like you say, you know, come and find your own way to do these songs. And I want to say that from my point of view, I had people telling me that. I had, I had uh, some people I respected saying, you know, you're from Appalachia, you have a right to sing these songs. And at the same time, I did not spend 20 years singing those old songs. And so I knew that there was something that people who had done that would not hear in my voice. And I had to keep working. I wanted to show respect, I think was what I wanted to say. I wanted to show a deep respect for the music. I didn't want to just toss it off like, you know, hey, I'm going to do this. And, you know, I'm a commercial singer. And I wanted, I wanted to try to sink my teeth in a little bit. And I had to keep running it by people that I trusted. Um, when I made that first record, Marty Stewart produced it. And I was like, look, if Marty Stewart tells me I right. live well on these songs, I can trust that. Right. But I had to have several people in my world like that. Art Menius pulled me aside and said, well, you know, that's really interesting. We play a lot of traditional songs around here, but we don't usually try to cover any Hazel Dickens. You know? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, he was just like, and I'm, I, I thought no one ever has to hear me do this, but I'm going to try. And, and so I just wanted to say, I, I was trying to find the, the happy medium between the showing the respect and finding my own voice with it and understanding that I'm not, I'm not ever going to be able to do that. But it may not be 
I may be able to bring this music. This is the thing that happened. I played a show when my Cole record came out in Nashville, and my accountant came. And he came up to me after the show, <laughs> and his first question was, who is Hazel Dickens, and where can I find more? Aww. And I thought, that's what I can do. These people who've forgotten yeah. Hazel and forgotten Jean and forgotten these people, I can be a bridge. And so there was a real sense of... of um, you know, wanting to sort of maybe open a window for people who might never be exposed to that music. Yeah, but another great quick caveat about that in the blues world. Blues players were never at an attitude about outsiders playing <coughs> the music, trying to play the music. Purists went crazy over the Rolling Stones. You know, Rolling Stone is a Muddy Water song. That's where they got the mm. name of the song. Got, went crazy over that. But Muddy Waters loved it. They're keeping the music, you know, you change it, you make it your own. You add this lick, you do this, you do it in a different key, use a different... I mean, these songs are done so many different ways anyway in, in the tradition. But you're keeping the music alive. They love that. They didn't... Mm. Uh, it, mm. they, they're not troubled by that at all. Why people go down and play this music, record them, learn how to teach me how to play this, play it, and Andy can vouch for that. Well, and I have to say, I, I, have, I have to say, I, the, the acid test for me was I played the National Folk Alliance, I played the, in Kansas City when this record had just come out, and, and I was ending my song with Black Lung. And I walk out on stage and Hazel Dickens is in the fourth row. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. And then it's like, well, Kathy, you know, either you own your version of this song or you don't. And, you know, this is the acid test for you. So I put on my big girl panties and I walked out there. I did my show and I, and I finished with Black Lung. And I'm sure she loved it. Hazel came to me after the show and she said, you know that? She introduced me to Alice. She said, I'd like you to meet my friend Alice Gerard. There I was with Hazel and Alice. <laughs> and no picture, which is great, because I got to just soak it in. But afterwards, I was like, I could have had a picture. So, but the thing I wanted to say that was so interesting to me that I keep thinking every time you speak about these old blues guys, um, she said, she, the first thing she said to me was, well, you know, it's kind of neat to sit out here and listen to it. You know, I always have to sing it, but I never get to really just listen to it. She said, that was kind of neat, because I'll bet nobody's had the balls to sing Black Lung for Hazel Dickens. It's a naive little me. And the other, thing, the other thing that really touched me was I said to her, I said, you know, I just want you to know that I've learned a lot from singing this song. I want you to know that it has, it has taught me so much about how to be in a song. And she just went... Well, you know, my brother, he had black lung, you know, and he was up there on the hill in the house, and, and he was in, in an oxygen tent, and she just told me the whole story. She had no reference point for what learning someone else's song to teach them about music would be because her relationship with music was so direct. And it was such a, like, a, she didn't even, there was no place in her brain for that. And it sounds to me like those guys are like, they're not concerned with tradition or not. They're just like, they want to meet somebody who's passionate about the music. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're definitely growing up on the tradition. I mean, they're hearing somebody play, and they're hanging out with that guy and bugging him until he starts teaching them something. But the fact is, all these guys all developed their own unique style anyway. So that you hear all these guys, you can tell who they are. They're all playing different versions of different songs, songs of you fall. Mm -hmm. They take these lyrics here and over there and, put them in and yeah, put them into this, recycle all these lyrics that are part of their life. But what's great about it, they're like things that apparently, you know, just day in, day out, got up this morning and the world was went to shit, you know. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, everything was gone. <laughs> yeah. The woman, the kids, the dog, pots, everything was gone. What the hell is this? And it seemed, you know, it's like it's uh, something that, well, if that happens, it feels the same way today as it ever did, you know. But they... Uh, had their own style, so Muddy Waters always played exactly the same way, and he played that so long and had <laughs> such a groove, mm -hmm. and it was so impossible to duplicate that he kept his audience. He wasn't going to play like the Rolling Stones, but the fact that they brought him to England 
and he was playing in front of all these people and the Stones were introducing this music to all these people. This saved their lives. They, they started making their living playing to white audiences when the black audiences mm. thought it was passe, it was old people's music, plantation music, we're uptown now, it's Motown, Supreme, you know, this is where we're at. And these guys, you know, they, their own kids never heard the music on the radio in those years. They, they, had a, they had a wait to be 21 to go listen to their parents in a club yeah. because they couldn't hear the music anywhere. Nobody's selling the records. Everywhere. So the fact that the music's been kept alive, and the Rolling Stones even went to Chicago. They jammed in Muddy Waters Club. They recorded it at the studio there that they were recording at to get that f flavor. And they, they did it because they said, yeah, this is real. This is really where this all comes from, all this rock. And funny, oddly enough, because I had that background, rock and roll passed me right out, over. Because musically, was three bangs and a lot, three, you know, three chords and a lot of yelling at first. And until the blues got into rock and roll, I never really was interested. It just sort of like, I would just rather listen to blues or, you know, because the musicianship was so much, it was so fantastic. But uh, yeah, I think that that is definitely, you got to write, everybody does. Mm. And it's, it's, it's in here. It's not in your, the neighborhood. I, I just love that you keep saying those the guys I learned from don't really care about all that. No, they don't. Stuff. I just think that they want you love the music. And hearing for you me say to that, and, too, yeah, because uh, yeah. you're yeah you're always a little worried about your, <laughs> your any songwriter cred. is always tickled that somebody wants to sing their song, you know, and it's very cool that you got to sing it for her in front of her. Very cool. Yeah. Can I okay. tell one? Go ahead. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm blabby, so please go. No blab. I was just going to say this session ended at three. I, I know. Think, but it's oh, all it right, did? But I, it did, and if anybody needs to Sorry go, please go. That. Please go. Something tell us that. one more story. <laughs> oh, one more story I wanted to tell that I thought would be interesting to the people who came. Please. Is um, I wound up playing at a, um, a, a benefit event around mountaintop removal stuff with Jean Ritchie one night, and uh, we, she came in in the afternoon. It was when her health wasn't very good, and uh, we were we had met each other several times, and uh, mm -hmm. and so we started talking about uh, her song in the cool of the day, or now it's the cool of the day, and um, she, I said, oh, I've been doing that. She said, Yes, I know, I heard, and I don't know where you got that. I don't know where you got that second line from. That is not the way I wrote the song. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Well, teach me. Then teach me your version, because I was trying to make it my own. So, but you know, she was famous for being very fierce about this. So, she teaches me, and I and I can do the Nashville number system. So she's telling me, and I have my little scratch pad on my phone, and I'm writing yeah. numbers, and I write it out, and I sing it back to her, and she's like, "That's it." And she also made it very clear that she was going to do that song that night. It was her song, and she was ending the night with that song, and she was doing it. I was like, no problem, really. I had no idea about doing that song. <laughs> so the, we show this film, and there's discussion, and then there's music, and she's the last thing of the night, and by then she's so tired. And she comes to me, and she says, I'm, I'm, I'm too tired, I think, to be able to sing that song. Will you sing it with me? Oh. And so... And again, there's no video or pictures. <laughs> Picture of us both. There's me hanging on for dear life, you know, and a photo, but there's no video. But she, so she starts to sing, and I, I was like her. I, I decided at that moment that I was going to be her, her musical walker, you know, <laughs> that, that she would be responsible for rhythm and, and pitch, or, and I would be responsible for holding the pitch up and holding the sustain. And so I was like shadowing her, and it was like the most intimate musical moment. I mean, to get to sing this with her, in her way, with her rhythm, and, and it was like a master class in front of 300 and people. And nobody recorded it? Nobody recorded it. Which I'm, <laughs> but, and it was, it was one of the highlights of my musical life, and um, uh, it was very, very intimate. It was very, that's all I can say about it. It was like one of the most intimate musical yeah, experiences amazing. I've ever had.